Um, now, of all the breakthrough music phenoms breaking out of Asia at the moment, the hottest act right now is not a K-pop boy band, not a J-pop girl band, and not a Cantopop balladeer. Um, it's actually a Chinese app from Shanghai called Musical.ly, uh, musical.ly. And since its launch about three years ago, the DIY music video app Musical.ly has experienced massive, mega explosive growth as one of the most popular apps on the planet. With nearly 200 million users, 60 million monthly active users, and 13 million videos uploaded per day, the Chinese Musical.ly app has been described as the new MTV where millennial users are creating videos, sharing videos, streaming videos, commenting on videos, in which these 15 second video clips are not only generating 15 minutes of fame, but even top 15 chart hits. But perhaps with more drama, more comedy, and maybe even more horror than HBO's hit TV show Silicon Valley, the Pied Piper story behind the app development of the Musical.ly app is a fascinating case study on how to pivot and flip WTF what the fuck moments into FTW for the win success. So without further ado, um, please, if you don't have lighters, put your smartphones up in the air. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to introduce the co-founder and co-CEO of Musical.ly, Alex Zhu. Now, Alex, your resume is very impressive. You've done stints at tech heavyweights such as SAP and Microsoft, uh, and in places as far flung as Shanghai and San Francisco. But yet among your various job titles, Futurist at SAP was actually one of them prior to launching your original education social network app. Is it Kikeda? Is that how it's pronounced? Cicada. Cicada, yes. Now, you've been very open and public about how the Cicada app flopped and the near bankruptcy of your startup forced you to radically rethink your business. In hindsight, how did a futurist like yourself misread the future the first time around? All right. Uh, so actually, I know futurist sounds to be a fancy job title. But actually, the job was pretty easy. <laughs> what I did at that time was quite simple. Sitting in my tent, playing around with my small crystal ball, telling the future. Artificial intelligence in 2020, augmented reality in 2022, and personalized curriculum in every school. It's easy, right? And I was pretty good at it. 50% of chance I was right, and the other 50% of chance I was wrong. But luckily, there is no people coming from future telling me, hey, Alex, this is wrong. So being futurist is easy. And because it's easy, so I got really bored. I want to walk out of my tent. I want to be a blacksmith. I want to be a carpenter. I want to be a fisherman. I want to be a doer. Eventually, it's the doer who creates the future, rather than just guessing it. It's the doer who actually delivers the value to the hands of end users, rather than just writing papers and articles and submit to websites. So I decided to take the risk and do something real for education. And I thought I got a brilliant idea to combine the concept of Twitter and the concept of Coursera, creating a UGC education platform around knowledge, sharing, and learning. Everybody can be teacher. Everybody can learn from everybody else. And we did a lot of sales pitch to investors, and we got money. We spent seven months creating the first education app. And finally, it turned to be a very miserable failure. Now, recognizing that uh, not only was this app not what you envisioned and not what it should have been, could have been, and you basically realized this is going to fail miserably. When, where, and what was that epiphany moment that uh, made you scrap the education app and go all in 
on something completely radically different, an entertainment app, musically. And more importantly is, what did you tell your original investors that basically invested in your original idea? How did you resell them into the idea that I was completely wrong, I have to go a different direction? How hard was it for you to go back to your investors and, and repitch a new idea? Uh, concerning the moment of truth, uh, there were two moments of truth. The first one was for the education platform, I created my first content, education content, about coffee. Basically talk about the history of coffee. It was only three minutes long, because the whole idea is trying to make content concise. So you can learn everything within three minutes, right? But it took me two hours to create that content. <laughs> you know, trying to collect information from Google, trying to put my voice over talk, talking about coffee. And then I didn't like my voice, I didn't like the way how I structure, um, you know, the talk. And then I have to do it again. It's, it's so miserable. There is huge unbalance between the cost of production and the happiness from the consumption. I don't want to watch that content, but in order to create it, you have to spend so much effort. And then I know it's never going to take off. And the other moment of truth is, one day I was on Caltrain from uh, Mountain View to San Francisco. And on that train, there were lots of high school students, and I was observing their behavior. 50%, they were listening to music. And the other 50%, they were taking videos and photos, selfies, and put the stickers on top and share around. And they had some good laugh around it. So that gave me some idea. First, entertainment is going to be much easier than education, because education is against the human nature. <laughs> and ent entertainment is basically following the human nature. If YouTube started with an education platform, it will never be as big as today. But because YouTube started with entertainment, so today, due to its scale and the diversity, actually lots of people are using YouTube for education. All right. And the second insight I got from it is for teenagers, for high school students, especially in the US, especially in, in Europe, they spend lots of time on social media and they love music, they love videos. And can we combine these three very powerful elements into one platform, creating a social network around music and around video? So that was the idea, how the idea came along. Now, obviously when you were pivoting from your education app to this entertainment app, you mentioned uh, in our earlier conversation that you had a short list of numerous ideas of yes. what this new app could be. What was sort of the alternate reality that if you hadn't gone with Musical.ly, what were sort of the other two leading contenders of this is what the app could have been? Yeah, the, the other two ideas in the short list um, were still around education. Because I, I, I was really passionate about education. One idea was a language exchange between US and China. Uh, there is obviously supply in the US and there is ob obviously demand in China. If we can match the demand and supply, it can be solid business. Second idea is um, looking for mentorship for college students and for people who just graduate. If they want to get some professional mentorship, they can go to this platform and look for it. But again, all these ideas are around education and learning which is a really hard problem to solve for a startup from the very beginning. Today, we have the scale, and actually we are thinking every day, 
how we can inject education into the platform, into Musical.ly now. And now we have much better opportunity than three years ago. Um, now, it's becoming more the rule rather than the exception that uh, the biggest pop stars in the world, be it Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Selena Gomez, they connect with their millennial fans and promote they're not so little monster hits on Musical.ly. Who was the first major artist to jump on your platform? And more importantly, who has been so far the biggest, I can't believe they're using Musical.ly uh, artist that has come across your radar? Uh, I remember the first big artist on Musical.ly was Jason Derulo. Uh, and he was really active on Musical.ly as well as Lively. Um, creating lots of music videos, doing a lot of uh, music campaigns, and broadcasting him dancing in his uh, you know, studio. And then more and more artists came, like Selena Gomez, um, Lady Gaga, Katy Perry, and so on and so forth. I think Lady Gaga was probably uh, one of the artists uh, I personally felt so excited about, because I loved you know, her personality, her uniqueness, uh, and finally, she landed on Musical.ly. Um, but over time, when more and more big artists came, you kind of lost track of them. It's the top artists have created a lot of value for the platform's growth. But we shouldn't spend too much time and effort trying to get artists top artists on the platform. Why? Because I think, I believe, those top artists is more a consequence rather than the cause. Okay. When the platform satisfies the needs of majority of people, everyday people, then the platform can scale. And when the platform scales, the artists, they will come sooner or later. There is no single platform that can prosper because they have a few artists. The platform must focus on majority of people. So that's a big lesson I learned through uh, these years. So in terms of not just obviously having, becoming a magnet for the biggest pop stars in the world, um, one of the really interesting sort of promotional campaigns uh, on your platform is the hashtag next wave where new artists, particularly emerging indie artists, have been able to ride these 15 second clips to 15 minutes of fame and, 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 and chart success. Now, recently, um, you guys have been involved and engaged in some partnerships, uh, namely Apple Music. How have these partnerships helped not only optics, but more importantly, the analytics of musically driven hits? Is it easier now to monitor, and more importantly, uh, for these artists to monetize uh, their exposure on Musical.ly? Yeah, uh, so the idea behind the integration with Apple Music is uh, a lot of users that told us for Musical.ly, it's not only about video discovery, it's also about music discovery. They find lots of new songs every day on the platform. And if you think about it, the nature of Musical.ly is UGC videos, user-generated videos. And one of the secret sauce is we give material to end users to make it easy for end users to create contents on top of the existing materials. And music is one of the materials. And because the material is professionally made, that gives professional, professional quality to the UGC videos. Right. And because of it, there is huge promotional power for music. It's not like we promote the music, it's the users who use certain music to create videos and share on all social media. Those millions of users make a particular song popular everywhere. Now, right now, social media has obviously not just become um, a viral, but more importantly, a very vital A&R tool to find the next big thing. 
Adele was discovered on MySpace. Uh, music manager Scooter Brown bottled lightning not once but twice on YouTube by discovering Justin Bieber and Psy. And Shawn Mendes, who this summer knocked out and knocked off Despacito from number one in the US, he was actually spawned from the now shriveled up service Vine. Who would you consider to be the first breakout musically music star? And more importantly, who should we be on the lookout for in 2017 and 2018, courtesy of Musical.ly? Uh, there are two names coming into my mind. Uh, first one is um, Lisa and Elena, 16 years old uh, in Germany. The top users on Musical.ly, we call our users Muses. Uh, and they just released their first song, and it became a hit on Musical.ly. Uh, I think they really have the talent in singing and dancing. I think that's the talent we should watch in the next few years. Can be really, really big. And they already have the social media as a base to promote themselves. The second uh, artist is, uh, is a Spanish artist uh, named, uh, uh, actually uh, it's hard for me to pronounce, you know, Alvino uh, Sola. How would you spell it? I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we, we worked with this artist um, like several months ago to promote his uh, new Spanish song. And we did some cross-continent promotion, and the song became a hit, not only in you know, Spain, but also in Mexico and in all Spanish-speaking uh, countries. And then something interesting happened is he collected the most interesting clips submitted from users and burned into his official music video. And he announced the winners. And then he did a private lively session, live streaming concert for the winners. That became a very interesting promotion mechanism he's using to promote his, his songs. Now, obviously, given the popularity of Musical.ly with, with high schoolers, um, your company has actually reportedly taken on the role almost of like a high school guidance counselor uh, in the sense that uh, Musical.ly is very active in advising and mentoring your most popular personalities with some of the biggest talent agencies and record labels in the world. How and why did this particular mentoring guidance service emerge? What was the motivation for taking these emerging personalities, potential stars, and making sure they, they soft land properly into the uh, land of celebrity? Actually, we didn't do too much. Um, we realized Musical.ly is a content platform rather than a content business. We don't produce contents. We don't manage talents, and we don't work closely with certain talents to make sure they're successful. However, the core competence of Musical.ly is traffic. It's to design a traffic mechanism that match the supply and demand. And the efficiency of the whole traffic system, the distribution system, determines the success of the platform. So we have to focus on the mechanism, the invisible hands, rather than spending a lot of time with individual artists. But we have to make sure more and more artists, not because they work closely with us, but because they have the talents, they have the audience, they succeed on the platform. Now, the platform itself has really moved beyond music videos, music lip sync clips, dancing, singing. It's really evolved into something um, that's really in and of itself become a whole new platform. You mentioned earlier that you went from education to entertainment, but now education is still something that's in the back yes. of your mind. Um, what's been really fascinating is the fact that uh, besides promoting new artists, you're also promoting social campaigns, youth issues. And how did that sort of become part of your business model? What was the impetus that made you say, hey, we need to add this into our um, stream of, of consciousness for our users. What, was, what, what pushed you to put that out there? Yeah, there were um, you know, two sources of inspiration. Uh, the first source is the inner source. We always wanted to do, to do something around education. 
Uh, and especially considering uh, we have a lot of young people, teenagers on Musical.ly, um, it's so important to build a global connection, connectivity within these young users all over the world before somebody inject some stupid ideas into their mind. You know what I mean? So we, we see this is a mission of a social media platform to create that positivity, to create that global connectivity. And the other source of inspiration was actually coming from the user community. So we, we, are, we are communicating with our users every day on WeChat. Users from the US, US users from uh, Europe, from Asia, and those users played a critical role in, design, in designing the part, in designing the community. They came to us, giving us some ideas. Hey, today you should try to think about how to embrace live streaming into Musical.ly. And then we took the idea. We created a platform, Lively. It was coming from the users. And tomorrow they came to us and they say, let's do an anti-bully campaign. Let's do a cancer awareness campaign. And then we took the idea and worked with these influencers, creators, and users to make this happen. So, so we mentioned uh, the anti-bullying campaign. This yes. was something that was coming from the users. Yes. And how was that campaign executed? What was sort of the mechanics and elements that you took from the idea in the user community to, to reality? Yes. Uh, so first, it was proposed by our users within WeChat. And we have a unique program which we call Musical.ly Raps. So these are the users who represent Musical.ly in different countries. And they do have certain influence on the platform. Uh, some are big influencers, some are smaller. And we coordinate for every campaign, especially on this anti-bully campaign. Make sure these top creators, they create something under this thing and publish together. And also post on other social media to make this really a social campaign across the platform. Now, in addition to these social campaigns, and you mentioned briefly um, that you've now launched a Lively, a yes. live streaming platform. Yep. But one of the other big announcements that happened this summer was as much as people from investors to fans uh, you know, consider you guys sort of the millennial MTV, you're actually working with MTV. And in yep. fact, your platform is now becoming a showcase for new short form original programming. I was wondering if you could talk about what this programming is looking like and sort of how Musical.ly has evolved to becoming now a, a destination for, for original programming. Hmm. Um, ever since the beginning of Musical.ly, 100% of the contents published every day are from users, 100% UGC. And once we reached a certain scale, we were thinking to bring PGC onto the platform, professionally generated contents on the platform. But again, we are not content business. We don't produce contents. So we try to build a content ecosystem which includes individual creators as well as the professional creators like MTV, like Hearst, and so on and so forth. So the show format it's kind of similar to Snapchat, but also different. So it's safe to assume that they're not 15 seconds long. No, it's not. <laughs> what's, it's what's usually sort of... three minutes, mm -hmm. five minutes around a certain topic. It's very topical. Yeah. Um, but, but we want to do it differently with Snapchat. Snapchat Discover is very interesting. It's very well done, but a little bit too polished. We want to maintain some rough, roughness of the contents. We want the contents still have some UGC quality and PGC quality combined. And we want those media partners to work with the community and generate the show in a collaborative fashion. So they work with our influencers, our creators on each episode. Talk about something that is interesting for the whole community and we allow the end user to submit contents for the next episode. 
So that's, that becomes a very unique format. So it's, it's almost a, a virtual, virtuous cycle of yes. content being created, content being inputted, content being outputted. Okay. Exactly. Now for an app, a platform, and, and obviously now it's very much a new social media video community, uh, and the fact is, is that it's emerged from China and spread like wildfire worldwide, especially in major Western markets such as the US. But how has the impact and influence been in Asia? And more importantly, a lot of media spotlight has been cast on US artists discovering and being discovered on Musical.ly. Have there been any new or more importantly noteworthy Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Southeast Asian acts effectively using Musical.ly? And do you think Musical.ly could be potentially maybe a gateway for Asian acts to find crossover success in the US and possibly maybe around the world? Yes, um, so, so similar to what I mentioned earlier, uh, I think for the Asian markets, we basically follow the same path um, as the European and the US market. Initially, we don't spend the resource trying to bring the top artists in, because it's not going to help us too much. The most important thing at this moment is to build the user base a scalable user base. And in order to do it, we have to do a lot of marketing. We have to localize the product, localize the experience. So for Chinese people, when they land on Musical.ly, they don't see a lot of Western contents. They see local contents. And then we improve the retention, and then we grow the end users and the user base. And once we have the critical mass, it's time to bring emerging artists and make sure the emerging artists, we build the success stories around them, make sure they can break. And some of them even can break internationally. And then the big artists will come and follow the path. And, and so far, uh, we have gained the users quite fast, especially in markets like Southeast Asia, India, Japan, and Korea. And for China, uh, we just started, and we expect the growth to be accelerated in the next few months. Um, and what's, what's really interesting is, is that um, for a Chinese-developed, Chinese-designed, and Chinese-programmed app, why was China one of the last markets you entered? What was sort of the reason or, or rationale? Um, China is a very different market. Um, the competition is different. It's much more intensive. And all the companies that are burning money to buy influencers, to buy the traffic, to buy creators. So it's an expensive business to operate in China. And in order to run the China market, you do have to put a, a big operation team and put a big budget around it. So that's why in the last two years, in order to keep the company smaller, in order to grow more organically, we made an informed decision. Let's focus on countries outside, outside of China first. But this year, we're entering, because we also see the potential synergy between the China market and the global markets. There are lots of Chinese artists who want to become famous in the US, and we have the leverage. We have the global audience as the leverage. And when we talk with creators and artists in the US, everybody is fascinated by the potential of the China market. So if we build the audience in China, millions of DAU, tens of millions of DAU, then we can boost our global market as well. So that's why China has become a priority this year. That's great. Um, and in closing, this, this, uh, we're, we're running out of time here. I want to open the floor. Are, is there anybody out there that uh, has a question for Alex? Um, it's hard with the lights to sort of see the hands up, but if anyone can say, here, we'll, we'll throw a mic your way. Anybody, anybody out there? Possibly, maybe? Well, then I think in order to sort of keep uh, 
all that matters on schedule and on time. Thank you so much, Alex, for your time up here. And thank you, everybody, for making time to listen to this wonderful chat with co-founder, co-president, co-CEO of Musical.ly, Alex Chu. Thank you.